Hi, welcome to Anna Prime Recap. You will pass through a macabre town, where various tombstones are scattered all over the place and the residents are hiding a frightening secret. We continue with our dark journey through the macabre stories of Junji Ito Maniac. Our first story today is titled, Where Sandman Lives. In a cafeteria, Yuji asks his friend Mari to help him with a serious problem. He explains that for some days his alter ego has been trying to take full control of his body. The writer says that his other personality lives in his dreams and tries to break free every time he sleeps. Yuji reveals that he has been without sleep for three days. Mari replies that his friend should see a doctor to try to solve his problem, as this could be a hallucination of his own thoughts. The writer is angered that his friend does not believe his story and leaves disappointed. While walking down the street, Mari comes to him and says she will help him with whatever he needs, so Yuji asks her not to let him sleep at all. That same day, the girl goes to her friend's apartment and notices that he is weak, listening to the radio with his headphones in front of the TV. Yuji thanks his friend for her help and offers her coffee, as it is the only drink he drinks every day. As the hours pass, the boy talks that his body will not be able to stay awake for long, for this reason, he asks Mari to bind him with several ribbons to restrain his alter ego from breaking free completely. The girl obeys and binds her friend's arms and legs, at which point Yuji cannot stand the lack of sleep and instantly falls asleep. Mari observes the situation her friend is in and after he sleeps, she cuts all the restraints and puts a blanket over him. A few hours pass and Mari also falls asleep. Around 11 o'clock at night she wakes up with some noises in the apartment and is confronted with the most bizarre scene she has ever seen in her entire life. Yuji's body was crawling on the floor, while one of his arms was trying to get out of his mouth. The girl is frightened by this and screams for her friend. The young man regains consciousness and tries to put the bizarre arm inside his body, asking Mari to help him pull it out. In addition, his fingers also needed to be pulled out, as they were shrunken. After this terrifying scene, Yuji reveals that that arm that was coming out of his mouth was his alter ego trying to break free into the real world. Mari so far cannot believe what she has seen, she says that the human body is not hollow and turning it inside out would reveal all its organs. Yuji claims that there is only one answer to this, he has been empty inside since the day he was born or when he lost his entire family. The girl says that this is not true, at which point the writer reveals a part of his story that he has never told anyone. The boy tells that when he was a child his dream was to fly like a bird, and he even tried to put wings on his arms to achieve his goal, but failed. In his dreams he also tried to fly, for in the dream world everything is possible, but he could not. In this place he was also humiliated by a figure that looked just like him. Mari then asks why this alter ego tries to leave the dream world, since in the dream world everything is possible. Yuji replies that his other personality has a desire for Mari, which is why he always tries to leave his world. After these words, the writer thanks his friend for her help and says he can't bear to live under these conditions, so he asks the girl to leave the place, and then falls into a deep sleep. Mari despairs at the boy's withdrawal and tries to wake him up, but realizes that it is already too late, so she uses tape to bind her own hand with Yuji's hands. She says that she will not let his alter ego break free and will stay with him until last. A few seconds later Yuji's arm is pulled into his body and as a result Mary's arm is also taken into the young man's body. Then Yuji's other arm is also pulled into his body, at which point two arms begin to come out of his mouth. His body began to turn inside out, and Mari, because she was attached to him, was also pulled into him. After a few days, two police officers go to Yuji's house, they call for the writer but get no answer, so they open the door with one of the apartment owner's keys and observe that Yuji is sitting on the floor. The policemen say that Mari Igarashi is missing and they are looking for some clues to find her. Yuji calmly gets up and answers that they won't be able to find her, because she is inside him, trapped in the world of dreams. Now we will move on to the second story, called, Tomb Town. Tsuyoshi and his sister Kaoru are on a vacation trip to meet Izumi, a friend they both have in common. In the middle of the journey, the older brother tries to look at a map to see if they are on the right road, but in doing so takes his concentration off the steering. Kaoru warns that there is a person in the middle of the road, Tsuyoshi tries to break the car before it could hit her, but is unable to stop in time. Upon impact, the girl who was in the middle of the road is thrown a few meters. The brothers try to render aid, their plan is to take her to the nearest hospital, however, she is already badly injured. Tsuyoshi puts her in his car, then Kaoru realizes that the girl no longer shows any vital signs. She explains the critical situation to her brother, but he doesn't say a word, just continues on his way to town. While driving, Tsuyoshi thinks about getting rid of the girl's body and believes that the mountains are the ideal place to do this. When they arrive in town, the brothers come across a strange monument in the middle of the street, Kaoru realizes that it was a tombstone, 
but doesn't understand why someone would put it in the middle of the street. Tsuyoshi just goes around the object with his car and drives up, but a few seconds later, they come across a street with numerous scattered gravestones. Tsuyoshi realizes that he will not be able to follow the road with that blockage, so he decides to go back, but when he reverses his vehicle he ends up destroying a gravestone. The boy gets out of the car to try to fix the problem, and some locals approach him and offer to help him fix the vehicle. The men say that they will have to use the hydraulic jack to make the adjustment, so they ask the driver to get the object from the trunk. Tsuyoshi tries to act without arousing suspicion, he quickly opens the compartment and removes the object that was beside the girl's body. After a few minutes the car is repaired and the residents explain that there are tombstones all over the city. At first, they appeared in places where people lost their lives due to traffic accidents, but as time went on, they were placed wherever someone died. At this point, Izumi arrives on the scene and finds her friends, after the incident, she takes them to her home. Izumi says that she has gotten used to all the gravestones around town, including one in her house where the former resident lost his life. The girl says that her friends should not worry about this and invites them to take a walk through the city. There are gravestones scattered everywhere. While walking, they pass in front of a hospital and come across a situation that is common in the region. The doctors carry a patient outside and leave him on the ground. Izumi explains that if they don't do this, the hospital would become one big tombstone warehouse, because many people lose their lives there, so in order to avoid a big agglomeration of tombstones, the doctors bring out the terminally ill patients and let them die. After a few minutes walking through the city, the trio finds a cat that had died as a result of a hit-and-run accident. Suyochi has the idea of removing the animal's body from the street, but Izumi warns him not to do so, since the stone will be placed exactly where the cat lost its life. Kaoru feels bad as she remembers what she and her brother did, so Izumi returns home with her friends and provides care for the girl. While they were talking in the living room, Izumi's mother asks her daughter if Ayumi had arrived yet, the girl answers no and wonders where she could be at that moment. Suyochi, out of curiosity, asks who Ayumi is. His friend replies that she is her younger sister. The girl left alone in the morning and went for a walk in the mountain region. As it was late, Azumi's parents are worried that she has been taken away, so they decide to call the police. Suyochi and Kaoru listen to all the conversation in the room and come to the conclusion that the girl in the trunk is Azumi's sister. Kaoru tells him that she didn't recognize her before because her face was completely swollen. The next day, the police begin the search for Ayumi. The two brothers also decide to help find the missing girl. Suyochi tries to comfort Izumi and tells her that her sister will surely be found safe. The rescue team explores the entire mountain region, but cannot find any trace of what might have happened to the girl. At this point, one of the villagers says that they could look in the vicinity of the sanctuary. All the people go to the site, but nothing is found. Suyochi asks the old man about a well that was in that place and finds out that no one knows who built that structure. The man also reveals that the well has the function of storing the bodies of people taken from the place where they lost their lives. The man asks the two visitors to follow him to the hospital to observe with their own eyes how the process occurs. When they arrive there, the brothers are confronted with the body of the patient who had died the day they were walking with Izumi. They notice that the body begins to gain a rocky layer and gradually takes on the shape of a tombstone, so the brothers understand that the tombstones are generated from the body of the person or animal that lost its life. They are tormented by this fact and decide to return to Izumi's house, but when they get close to the place, they realize that the girl was watching the inside of Suyochi's car. Izumi tells her friends that the police found blood and breaking marks on the road near the mountain. She is confused and believes that her sister may have been run over, after which she gets on her bicycle and says she is going to the site to find some clue. Kaoru feels bad about the whole situation and tells her brother that she can no longer bear to hide the secret. Suyochi asks her to hold on, and that same night, after one last conversation with Izumi, they decide to leave town. The boy drives to the shrine and tells his sister that he will throw Ayumi's body into the well, because no one will be able to find her. He gets out of the car and opens the trunk, and as he does so, he is confronted with an extremely bizarre image. The girl's body was totally destroyed with a strong odor and some parts were already being petrified, he asks his sister to help him carry her to the well and when he gets there, he gets rid of Ayumi's body. During all this process, Suyochi ended up cutting himself with one of the rocks coming out of the girl's body, and the bracelet the girl had on her wrist fell near the well. A few minutes later, Suyochi begins to hear a strange noise coming from the well and then a gigantic creature comes out of it. The monster is made up of several bodies that were dumped there, and on top of it was Ayumi. The girl screams uncontrollably and says that Suyochi is the one who ran her over, he tries to tell her it's a lie, but at that moment Kaoru calls his name and the boy realizes he was having a bad dream. Immediately, they return to the city and try to leave all the chaos behind. 
Koro is determined that she will carry this guilt until the last day of her life. A few days pass and Izumi, trying to find clues about her sister, finds her bracelet beside the well at the shrine. Suyochi was in a lot of pain due to the wound on his hand, gradually several boulders began to appear, it didn't take long before the boy was completely covered by stones, becoming a terrifying creature. Izumi and her family could not bear to live with the loss of Ayumi, and a few days later, they became three tombstones. Now let's start the story of the third tale, entitled, Mold. Akasaka returns to his home after spending a year working abroad, during all this time, his residence was rented out to his former teacher, Rogi, who lived there with his family. Upon entering the place, he realizes that there was no one there, he walks down the hallway and when he gets to the kitchen he finds food scattered everywhere and a lot of dirt. He opens the refrigerator and is very upset to see that all the food was spoiled. Akasaka goes to the bathroom to clean himself and finds his bathtub filled with a disgusting, rotten substance. At that moment he hears his brother's voice in the doorway and quickly goes to seek explanations from him. Seiji says that he did not expect his brother to arrive so early and apologizes for not cleaning the house before his arrival. The boy then goes off to find the pet Akasaka had left for the family to take care of. Akasaka recalls that one year ago, his brother called asking him to rent his house to Professor Rogi and he promptly refused, because he didn't like that man. Seiji insists that Rogi was renovating the house and needed a place to stay. For this reason, the boy gets his brother's permission. The next day, Rogi goes to Akasaka's house with the whole family, the old man tries to be extremely kind, however, Akasaka decides that he really won't rent the property and says that he should look for another place to live. Rogi begs and says he has looked in many places and his last hope is the house of his former student. After much begging, Akasaka gives in and allows them to stay until he returns from his trip. Back in the present, the boy tries to sleep in his room, but is bothered by the presence of a rotten layer that has taken over all the walls of his room, as the days go by, Akasaka realizes that it is a mold that begins to consume his entire house quickly. The boy calls his brother to come to the place, Seiji is overwhelmed by this and can't even say something to comfort his brother. Akasaka asks what Rogi and his family did with the house and where they went, after all, they must have already rebuilt the old house. However, Seiji replies that they disappeared and their home was never rebuilt. Akasaka then explains that the mold has completely spread and there are some rooms that he can no longer enter. Seiji doesn't even want to enter the place and is startled when he sets foot inside the house. He then explains that one day, he decided to visit the family and saw only the baby crawling around the house, but the child was entirely covered by mold and was shedding remnants wherever he went, his sister was at the end of the hall and her legs were also already being consumed by mold. Seiji advises his brother to leave the house and no longer live in that place, Akasaka asks if he can live with the boy and he replies that it is a good idea. That night, the boy tries to go up to the second floor and realizes that the mold was advancing further and further. He walks down the hallway and due to the humidity comes into direct contact with the mold. When he scratches his face he is contaminated with particles of this disgusting substance. He manages to get into one of the rooms and realizes that Rogi and his entire family have joined the mold in the house, the bodies were hideous and covered in the disgusting substance. A few minutes later, Akasaka begins to feel a strong itch on his face and as the day progresses, his entire body is covered in mold. Finally, we come to the fourth macabre story, titled, Unendurable Labyrinth. Two friends walk through a mountainous area to explore the place. Noriko and Sayako come across many monuments and the remains of old buildings. They take the whole route smoothly, but at a certain moment they come across a line of monks walking through the forest. Noriko is curious about this and tells the monks if she can ask them a question, but none of the men answer her, they just stare at the girl with expressionless looks. Sayako finds this bizarre and tells her friend that they shouldn't spend the night in that place, so they should continue walking. Along the way they reach a waterfall and notice that the monks were also there. At that moment, a monk appears behind the girls and explains that those are students in training, he tells them that that place is sacred and far away from the outside world, for this reason it is difficult to find the entrance or the exit. He deduces that the girls are lost and asks them to spend the night at the temple, because it is dangerous to go down the mountain at night. The monk takes the two friends to the sacred place, saying that they are practitioners of esoteric Buddhism, seeking calm between body and soul. He asks if the girls would like to participate in a meditation class, but Noriko rejects the proposal, however, Sayako thinks it is a good idea and convinces her friend to participate together. At night, the girls perform a group meditation with several other people in a room. While concentrating, Sayako begins to be tormented by negative thoughts that arise from her classmates who have always despised her. Later, they share a room with a student, her name is Aya Kuramoto, she explains that she has a social anxiety disorder and believes meditation can help her. 
However, she soon reveals that she is actually looking for her brother, who disappeared some time ago when he joined the group of monks and has never been seen again, so she has entered that temple with the intention of discovering his whereabouts, but so far without success. The next day, the three roommates are surprised by a strange gathering of monks, Sayako says that she heard one of the students say that it is the Sokushinbutsu ritual that is performed every three years. Aya explains to the girls that this is a practice where monks are buried alive in a box to be mummified when they die, this being an illegal practice. They realize that some monks are following a path and Aya decides to go after them to try to find her brother. Noriko and Sayako join the girl and go after the monks. The man responsible for taking them to the temple discovers that the girls have run away, but he doesn't care and says that they would rather walk in the earthly world. The trio walks through the forest and arrives at a place where the torches have been extinguished and left behind. At this place, there is a large statue of a Buddha and Aya realizes that there was a secret passage behind the ancient monument. They enter through the door and find themselves in a large, cold, dark corridor. After walking for a few minutes, they come across a room full of mummified monks. Aya tries to look for her brother until she finally finds him already lifeless. Distraught, she asks Noriko and Sayako to leave her alone. The girls obey and try to find their way out of the place, but along the way they feel increasingly cold and claustrophobic. Sayako begins to regret leaving Aya alone and tells her friend that the monks are judging her attitudes with a look of disgust. Noriko says that the mummified monks are not looking at anyone. However, when they look again, they realize that everyone was watching them with a blank and frightening look. Tell me which of these stories was the most disturbing. Do you think you could survive all of them? So, what did you think of this anime? Leave it in the comments below. And if you liked the video, like it and subscribe for more anime recaps. See you next time.